Yes, you did. All right. Okay, so welcome all and spread the word. And Tamal, it is all yours. And Tamal, where are you? <laughs> Tamal, Tamal, you are welcome. Uh, oh, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Guys? Can you guys hear me? Uh, Tamal, I can hear you very well. I can see your screen now. So I guess others can hear you as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Steve, can you just uh, say something so we know that you can hear Tamal? Yes, I We're hear We're good. We're good. Okay. We're good. All right. Great. Okay. So with all of this uh, great in introduction and uh, Gil that is going to talk to you next week is great. So you, I know him and he's amazing. So I hear that you're expected to have a great uh, presentation next week as well. I'll introduce myself a bit better as we, as we go on. Please, um, just, just a few technicalities. Um, if at any point I, oh, I speak too loud, uh, I don't, you know, I'm not understood, I'm too fast. Um, you know, English is definitely not my mother tongue, so not, if I make mistakes, when I make mistakes, please feel free to either uh, correct me or forgive me in the spirit of these days. Uh, this is really your time, and I feel like I just joined a family where, you know, you're all kind of know each other and connected, so it's very special. To, uh, to join this kind of atmosphere. Um, and we'll start. I wanna say one, a few things about how this is gonna work. This is going to be something which is between a presentation to um, a talk, to a little bit of feeling of the streets of Jerusalem. We're gonna have a lot of video videos um, that, so the technicalities may, I'll, I'll ask for your forgiveness, we're going, to, we're going to be jumping into, in and out of YouTube to see some of the, uh, of the videos because I really want us to be able to feel what's going on and especially what uh, usually goes on in the synagogues in Jerusalem during the prayers and, you know, we'll move between what's happening these days and I'll also talk a little bit about just basic traditions because I don't know who you are. So the beginning is going to be just to kind of create a common ground for us so that we can move from there on at any moment. Uh, Yulia, if you can see the chat and interrupt or not interrupt, help me, direct me, bring in questions. Okay, folks, it's your time. I, I'm used to being in dialogue with my groups, not seeing them through um, masks um, and through, um, you know, screens. So, okay. Let us start with that. Tell me if you can hear the music. Yes, the music. I'm going to pause the videos from time to time. Great. The, um, most of what we're doing tonight, tonight, today, we're going to be shifting between two areas in Jerusalem. Have you all been to Israel before? Most? All? Have you been to Machniu, the food market? Mostly? Okay. Our tour is, our, our conversation here is between the little neighborhoods which are just near Machniu, the food market, which are called Nachlaot, and, and around the old city. We're going to be hopping between different places. It's not going to be like a geographical tour like Ju Julia walks with you in, you know, live. Okay, so this is Nachlaot, the neighborhood, and let's just feel it.
בן אדם, מה לך נרדם? קום קרא בתחנונים. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this text. Human being, why are you asleep? Wake up, call, beg, demand forgiveness from the Lord of the Lords. Spill out your words. Wash yourself, cleanse yourself. Do not be late before the days are going to be gone. These words are the beginning words of the slichot prayers. I hold one of the sidurei slichot that are being said in, in synagogues, outside of synagogues. What you just saw here is an interesting thing because you would usually expect to find these tunes, these piyutim, these chants in a synagogue, but I'll talk about the process that took it out to the streets later on a bit. But this is the beginning of the text It has been read and sung in this, you know, realm of, you know, Jewish world for the past 35 days now. Before I'm going to continue and talk about that, I want to ask you a question. Imagine that you're sitting at home and somebody knocks on your door. You open the door and they hand a letter to you and your name is on the letter. You open the letter, you sign, the messenger goes off, and you, saw, and you open it, and you see something very strange written there. In 30 days from now, you are invited to court. This is a subpoena to court. In this court, all of your actions, all of your deeds and your intentions from the previous year are going to be taken into consideration. At the end of this you know, um, session, you're going to be getting a verdict either to life or to death. Now, what do you do with this piece of paper? Of course, it depends who you are. Some of us would turn it to the other side to see if somebody wants to sell an anti-stressant or whatever, or some of us would just throw it in the garbage. If it, would be a, it would be an email, it would go to the stamp, but some of us would take it very seriously. Some of us might put it on the desk and return to it possibly later. I don't know, as I said, who you are and what are your um, inner worlds and which communities you belong to and where are you in the Jewish faith. But a lot of the people within the Jewish community believe that we all receive a similar letter in the shape of the new moon of the month of Elul, exactly 35 nights ago. When the new moon of the Jewish month of Elul starts, it's a wake up call or it's a call for this, you know, prepare for the trial. Because some of us can say, you know, this trial thing is really, um, you know, we don't know exactly how to deal with it, but some of us take it, as I said, very seriously. And of course, I'm going to put a text in front of our eyes, which is very, I'm sure, you know, oops, I'm sure known to many of us. I'm just going to read it for a moment to make sure that we're all on the same page with it. And it comes from the Talmud. It says on Rosh Hashanah, Three books are opened, one for the thoroughly wicked, one for the thoroughly righteous, and one for the intermediates. The thoroughly righteous are immediately inscribed and sealed for life. I'm sure some of you, Rosh Hashanah, and you're set. The thoroughly wicked are immediately inscribed and sealed for death. The intermediates, Samoa, hang in the balance from Rosh Hashanah until Yom Kippur. If they're found worthy, then they are inscribed for life. If not, then they are inscribed for death. This text, basic text, is the engine between, uh, um, that, the channel that moves all of this process that the Jewish world is involved in for the past 35 days and within the next few days until Yom Kippur and actually even after Yom Kippur. 
Now, a lot of my um, very, very religious friends, and as you can see, I'm definitely not Orthodox, um, but I have some very good friends that are ultra Orthodox, and they take this text literally very, very seriously. And the understanding is that there is a judge, there is a tribe, and there is a decision to life or to death physically. Some of us look at it and say, well, this is kind of strange or it doesn't really speak to us. So as I said, we can either throw away the letter to the garbage or we can look at it as a wake up call. And one of the beautiful things that I've been learning about Judaism in the past 20 something, almost 30 years that I've been involved in learning Judaism is that it has an amazing potential and that I can look at this invitation as a metaphorical invitation to look at my life and to check, you know, you've been given a whole year. How did you use the minutes, the hours, the days that you were given? Let's say that there was a trial. Where are you right now? It's been a very challenging year for all of us. Where am I? If I have to put my life on a scale, you know, where are, where am I? How many resentments am I carrying? How many hurts? How many people did I harm? Am I alive as much as I can be alive? Because we know that when we carry harms and resentments, we're not as alive. And this is the metaphorical option to look at this time as days of waking up, looking into ourselves in order to return to who we really are. So I'm going to offer this as the uh, base for our conversation tonight. This is what this period is all about. The text, human being, why are you asleep? Of course, comes from the book of Jonah and all of us that go to Shul on, on Yom Kippur um, and stay there for, you know, long enough, get to the reading of, of the book of Jonah and the story of Jonah, that basically we have the whale here uh, that ran away from the mission that he received from God to be thrown into the water, to be swollen by the whale, to do his inventory, to go back out, to return to his mission and to help the people of, of Nineveh, not to... Um, not to let them know that the city is about to be destroyed, but to actually let them know, guys, this is going to be destroyed unless, and to help them go through tshuva, go through repentance. Okay, so this is what this is all about. Some people call these days the days of the lion. Lion in Hebrew is, do you have any aries, any arias with us? Arie. And the words, oh, the letters arie. A could be, in Hebrew, Aleph could be for A or for E, so it stands for the month of Elul, the first 30 days before Rosh Hashanah, R for Rosh Hashanah, Y for Yom Kippur, and the H at the end is for Hoshana Rabbah, the last day of Sukkot, which actually, this is the end. So if we have Elul is the month of the preparation for the trial, Rosh Hashanah is the trial, Yom Kippur, we have 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur to prepare for the appeal. And Hoshana Rabbah is like, okay, the last appeal and that's it for the year. Let me introduce myself for a moment. My name is Tamar Linczewski. I connect cultures, rituals, and people. Uh, this is me standing on the walls of the old city. To my right-hand side, you can see part of um, the church on the... Um, uh, the Mount of Zion. We're going to be visiting uh, the tomb of King David near there in a, as we move on through this uh, presentation. Um, I've been guiding, I've been tour guiding for 30 years now, started when I was 18. And when I was 20 years old, I fulfilled a dream. I grew up in a very, very secular Ashkenazi environment in the center of Israel, but I always wanted to be in Jerusalem. And when I was 20, as I was released from the army, a friend said, you should go and live in Nachlaot. Nachlaot is this amazing, this is a tiny little mosaic of the area of Nachlaot. It's a combination of tiny little neighborhoods that were built by people that came from all over. And 
just by the market and to be a 20 year old that lives and hears it from one window that, be, that I'm going to say some names that you guys might not even know like Jermukles and Urfalis and Zachos and Amedis these are all different communities that came especially from what we call Kurdistan uh, um, from Aleppo, from Persia, from Yemen, Hungarians, you name it, Hasidic, this tons of communities, an amazing mosaic, and in the heart of it, uh, when you're there, things happen. And a lot of my Jewish journey is connected to living for 10 very intense years in these little streets, in these little alleys, guiding in the synagogues. This is um, me guiding in the synagogue that we're gonna be visiting right now. It's called Ades. And you can see a little bit of the, of the beautiful paintings. Can you see the paintings here? You're going to see them in a minute in the video. This synagogue was established in 1901 by a community that came from Aleppo, Syria. Uh, they had with them the, um, uh, oh, I lost the word in a minute. No, the codex, the Aleppo codex, one of the most um, ancient text Bible that, that we have. Um, and it's, an extremely special synagogue. It's the biggest synagogue in the area, okay? We're talking about an area with about 4,000 residents, more than 100 synagogues. Most, most of them are smaller than the room that I'm sitting in right now, but they still hold minions. This is a picture from the same synagogue, as you can see right now, people sitting, they do not give up on the possibility and of the importance of studying or doing the slichot, uh, the prayers of this time together, but they're doing it outside with the masks. Um, the, I have to say, and, and, and Julia spoke about it before, that for a religious person, uh, for an Orthodox person that cannot have uh, Zoom from synagogue, not being in a minion, not being with the community for the prayers is, it's, it's, it's a heartbreak. It's, it's so hard. I spoke to a few people that are my neighbors here on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very, very hard thing to go through. So Ades, um, as I said, it's the biggest synagogue in the tiny, this tiny neighborhood, and it keeps those old traditions. Um, and I'm just, let's just jump into Slichot prayers, the special prayers that are said between the first of the month of Elul. I'm just gonna mute this for a moment. Um, to very generous people that allowed me to use some of those videos. Okay, I'm, I want to explain to us a bit what we're seeing so that we can observe and kind of, we're looking, this is of course a Sephardi synagogue. You can see the Aron, actually they have a few Torah books there. And we are entering this prayer in a very, very um, important moment of the prayer. They're about to say, well, let me ask you a question before I say, do you, um, do you know the song, Ech, uh, do you sing it on Passover? Ech, yeah? One is our God, two are the, the tablets, three are the fathers. Do you sing this song in English at all? No? Okay. So what is number 13? Number 13 is what we call the 13 qualities of God. And you're going to see in a few moments as we look into the prayer that everybody is bowing and then they're going to say a text that I'm going to go back into this text a little while, in, a, in a little while, but let's see, let's feel the vibe.
jumped but I want you to pay attention to a few things. First of all, of course, the men are downstairs. It's a far it's a far the synagogue. The bima is in the center. A few women are sitting up upstairs in the women's section. But look at this guy who just entered the room, this guy. And let's see who are the people that pray there. Some of the people that pray there are the elders that live in the neighborhood, people that, you know, their families established these neighborhoods in the beginning of the 1900s, late 1800s. They've been there for a few generations. But this area, this neighborhood is kind of like the Soho, maybe, of Jerusalem, if I may say. It's a very cool place to be. So a lot of young people come to live there. And one of the things that happened, and I have to say happened to me a few times, is that the young people, and you can see that this guy is definitely not orthodox, he put something on his head. Uh, or look at this guy over here. Okay. On the way back from the pub, because this session is taking place at about 4.30 a.m. to 5.30, and then they move into Shacharit. So this is like for people who seek special experiences, on the way back from the pub, a lot of the time the young people with their eyes uh, meet the elders that just woke up and they join hands and they say, Allah, let's go to shul together. And quite often we find people that would never step into a synagogue in their lives before enter into a synagogue because of the music, because of the search for the authenticity, because of the search of connection, because of, of this encounter, this very rich encounter in the neighborhood. And this is how a lot of the music, there are lots of musicians that live in the neighborhood, and a lot of the music, and if you're Israeli, you know what I mean, and Yulia, you know what I mean, a lot of this music is can be heard in Israel now, not only in the synagogue, like you saw the video at the beginning with these guys, this clip. And if you want, I'll send you a bunch of links. You can hear today top singers in Israel singing slichot tunes, those chants, on the biggest stages in Israel. So this is a cultural phenomena. It's not just a religious uh, ceremony anymore. Okay? We'll say goodbye to Ades here, unless someone wants to ask something or say something. Guys, people, you can always open your mics, okay? And feel free to... Uh... And I want to take us to another synagogue in the same neighborhood to give us a little bit more of the feeling of the people in the synagogue and what, uh, in the neighborhood and what's going on there. This is uh, originally a Persian synagogue that, if you know the Bane family, Singers, let's see what's going on there. Gem session before the Slichot prayers start at like 4.30, from 12, from midnight, you see, or sometimes you do the, the slichot prayers at 12.30 at night. It depends on the synagogue. These young people live in the neighborhood. A lot of them are religious, looking into religion, flirting with religion, exploring Judaism. This synagogue is kind of is one of the synagogues as that we call like the J-Date synagogues where you come and you hang out and a lot of people hang out outside and they've been coming to shul for two years, but they never really stepped in because, because. So you, have, you see men and women sit, sitting together, but it's not, they're not going to be sitting together for the prayer, just for the gem session. So let's hear the gem session, then I'm going to jump to the prayer itself. <laughs> The 
this is the tune from Neila, from the last prayer. You know, Neila, El Noah Alila, Hamtelan Mechila, Bishata Neila. And who's there amongst all the young people? One of the elders of the community. He's there to join the party. So we move to the Slichot prayer. Men are in men's section, women are here on the women's section, and this is prayer time. Adona Selichon, one of the most famous tunes towards the end of the Sephardi um, Slichot prayers. We're going to see the Ashkenazis as well in a, in a little bit, okay? But just, let now just listen and I'll shut up. <laughs> Many religious people, many artists, a little bit of um, graffiti. Here's an entrance to another very beautiful synagogue in the neighborhood. Um, lots of transitions and encounters and fusion between old and new, lots of creativity, lots of Jewish music that is being taken out from the synagogue, brought into the Israeli, um, you know, life, I'd say. And I want to leave the Nachalot for a little bit and just give us a feeling, a bit of the feeling of the, the views of Jerusalem as we're going. I'm, I've taken us towards the old city. We're standing on the wall of the old city here. This is me with my strange mask not too long ago. Uh, me, if you know, that's the Tower of David. I'm going to talk about King David in a little while. We're moving along, along the wall, seeing this area that is called the Mount of Zion, looking towards the east. This is the Mount of Olives, the Golden Dome. And as the sun is setting and the evening, kind of this transition between day and night, I want to take a moment to talk, go back a little bit to the concept of this time. Okay? So we said it's all about preparing for the trial and making sure that we're going to get out of, the, out of the trial as best as we can, right? So if you know that you're about to go, you know, on this very, very terrible trial, what do you do? You prepare the best. You take the best advocates. You learn from the best coaches. You take the best teachers. You're looking for the best witnesses to come and say, you know, hey, this, is, this, this person, she's fine. He's okay, you know. And this is what this process is all about. Now, the slichot prayers that we now, you know, witnessed in two places, and we're going to witness a few more in a little, in a little while, th these are the more apparent parts of the process. The other parts of the process are, you know, parts that we don't really see. As Julia said before, you know, she said, I can't go, you know, pray, but, you know, if I have hurt, if I hurt you, none of my prayers are going to work. So we have the three uh, parts, the three works, we say, that are here to help us use this time as a runway, you know, to fly high into a good year. The first is teshuva. The word teshuva could be said repentance, but I'm sure many of you know that the word teshuva comes from the word lashuv, which is to return to return to who we really are, to become who we originally are when 
we're good hearted and we don't harm others, or when we find it easy to forgive, these are the hardest words of this time to forgive and to try and make amends for what we've done. Tefillah, the prayer, which is most apparent, you know, during the Slichot, those special night prayers, very, very magical as we saw and we'll see. And the third is Tzedakah. Tzedakah could be called, you know, uh, charity, but for those of you familiar with the Hebrew word, Tzedakah comes from the word justice. It's the just thing to do, especially during COVID time. I'll tell you a little story that happened here today. My 18-year-old nephew has chose to take a year before the army to volunteer in a very special place. It's a home for kids that cannot live with their families. Um, and it's crazy because of COVID now. They've been going in and out of isolation and whatever. Today he went back there after being home for a little while. And I got a WhatsApp from him today saying, you know, we're collecting some uh, games for the kids, if you have anything. So of course, all of my WhatsApp groups get this thing, okay? We're collecting games. Within two hours, this home was filled up with books, games, you name it. My kids, especially my nine-year-old, she jumped into all of her games and she started taking out things. Mom, they're gonna enjoy this. Her little brother had a harder time. It wasn't easy. He said, he said, Mama, it's not easy for me to give. And I told you, I really, really understand you. And I told him the story, you know, when I came to live in Nachlaot, what you see here, this is a tzedakah box that is installed into a wall in Nachlaot, in the neighborhood of Nachlaot. And where I grew up in my Ashkenazi community, very, very secular, even anti-religious, when you would see somebody that says, give me, you would say, go to work. Or maybe you won't say, but in your heart, you would say, they should go to work. And when I moved to Nachlaot, and most of my neighbors were either religious or what we call in Hebrew Mesorati, which is not the conservative, but it would, see, it would be traditional. I saw people that really had much less than me when I was in my 20s. They put their hand in their pocket and they keep on giving. And I still say until today, the hardest gym muscle for me is to put my hand into my pocket and give it to somebody else. And it's one of the most important works, internal works that we can do today. So I told my little one, you know, your sister, she has it easy. It's easier for her to give. But the fact that you are willing to give today, wow, that's a huge thing. And he went to sleep smiling. And it's a huge work, especially, you know, I'm talking to you now. And at the end of this tour, I'm going to say, you know, uh, this is donation based. And I, this is ter I cannot do this. I never, I've never done it in my life. Never, never asked, you know, I have my prices, people pay me, you know, pre-corona. And now I'm practicing to be the one who's saying, you know, we're a community. So now I'm giving you something. And it's very, it's a very uh, powerful uh, ego reduction process, I have to say, the giving and the receiving. So, yeah. So this is about Sadaka, prayer. On the, the first night of the month of Elul, I, um, I went uh, synagogue uh, hopping uh, in Jerusalem and I saw this. I'll explain to you what we're seeing here. These guys, there is a man here, there is a man here, there is a man here. You can't see, but there is one here and there is one here and there is one standing here on the steps because they were not willing to let go of the prayer together in a minion but they were not willing to take the risk of sitting inside a synagogue. So they were doing their slichot prayers at night. Why at night? Do you ever take an inventory? This time is about an inventory, right? It's about checking, where am I? How did I use my year? What have I done? Who do I have to forgive? Who do I have to go and make an amends? By the way, the word shuva, and uh, sorry, kapara, is not only to ask for forgiveness because when I come to you and I ask for forgiveness, I ask of you to give me something. Please give me forgiveness. But what if you don't want? How do I make an amends without asking something of you? How do I take responsibility over my action and say, you know, I messed up. I messed up and I apologize. 
if you are willing to forgive me, I'll be very grateful, but I want to take responsibility and clean my part. That's a lot of the kapara part and the tshuva. And I have books sitting here. Whoa, tons of books about that. I'm not going to go into all of that right now. But I do want to take us uh, and take a look into a short video that I took inside the synagogue in the neighborhood Katamonim in Jerusalem. Um, during that night, it's the end of the Slichot session with the prayer of Vinu Malkenu. Again, it's a Sephardi synagogue. Let's take a look. It's from the women's section. Sorry, it's from the women's section, so it's not that good. <laughs> Does any of you, have any of you, I don't know, I'm sure now you don't, we don't have Israeli, many Israelis. You, Yuli, do you know this place? Just off Machne the food market? Okay, when you go to Machne the food market, 50 meters, what is it? A few feet, two minutes walk off Machne the food market, you find uh, tombs of two very righteous people, the Rebbe's of Ger, okay? The Admor, the Rebbe of Gur, of the Gur Hasidim, uh, died in 1948 during the War of Independence and was buried in his neighborhood. They couldn't take him to the, to the cemetery. His grandson in the 1990s asked to be buried near his grandfather. So in the middle of the neighborhood, just off the market, we find a point where people on every day You'll see people going out in and out of the market with the groceries, stopping for a moment, taking a moment to read something, to pray, put a little kvitala. You see, you know what kvitala has? Those, those little uh, notes with prayers and move on. During the slichot prayers, during the month of Elul, and then the, you know that uh, the Sephardis, they pray, they wake up for Slichot for the 30 days of the month of Elul and then the extra 10 days until Yom Kippur. The Ashkenazis, just from the beginning, four days before Rosh Hashanah, and there are lots of jokes about it, and they say, you know, that the Sephardis are being punished because they get to eat um, kitniot, you know, the Jews during uh, Pesach, so now they have to wake up for 30 nights. And the Sephardis say that the Ashkenazi tunes are so hard and boring, that the angels in the heavens don't want to hear them for so long, so they get them only for 10 days. Anyways, these guys are, of course, Ashkenazi. And one of the things that I wanted to show us here is that when we come to do this very hard process of tshuva, of repentance, um, we need help. And the help comes in different ways. One is that the process is very organized. And the other is that we have advocates. So if I messed up and I go to this person that I messed up with and I say, yeah, you know, I messed up, but you know, my mother and my, my father was Zakai Linchevsky. And they say, okay, you're the daughter of Zakai Bestede, okay? You're, you're, you're a young woman, but your father, I'll forgive you because of him. It's, some, it's similar. He said, you know, saying, you know, God, I'm so small. And a lot of the text in the Slichot is really saying, God, I'm so small, I'm a human being. I, may, I mess up, but you're so big. So, and you know, forgive me because, and through the help of my Rebbe. And if you know, there is a beautiful chant called Anenu that I may um, put for you in a minute. And he says, God, answer to us. Anenu Elohei Avram, 
Anenu, Anenu, Fachad List, you know, reply to us, you're the God of Abraham, you're the God of Isaac, you're the God of Jacob, and they are, they are my fathers. So not because of me, but because of them, you know, this is one of the things is to get advocates for your repentance. Another thing is that tshuva is a very inner process, you know, it's something that you either wrap yourself with a talif, or you wrap yourself with something, you know, physical, metaphorical, Go inwards because going inside, this is really tough. And I, I also, when I think about this geniosity in the Jewish cycle, I work a lot around the Jewish cycle and how smart it is that every holiday invites us to go through a different psychological process. And there is an understanding that we're all human beings, basically where probably most of us are intermediates, okay? Not the righteous, not, you know, the, the most terrible ones. And most of the time we're so busy running around being human doings that we don't have the time to stop and take an inventory and be, you know, be a human being just to pause. So, you know, the, the, the Jewish world says, you know what, I'm gonna organize this time for you. And since it's really hard, it's like it's really hard to diet by yourself or to jog by yourself it's really hard to take an inventory by yourself. So all of us are going to do it as a community. We're going to support each other on this process of going inwards. A few interesting rituals that are also nice to look at, which you may be familiar with, that help us on the process of tshuva. One of them is called tashlich. I'm sure you've, you're familiar with it when you go near a water source and you, you know, um, shake your pocket and you say this, you know, you ask that all of the bad things are going to be taken by the water. This, of course, is not in Jerusalem, it's by the sea, uh, but it could be done in a variety of ways. Another, uh, not easy to watch, I hope there are no vegans in the crown or, or like, except for me, um, it's just before, the first, the, the day before Yom Kippur, it's a chicken and there is a text and tonight at dinner, my partner told me how when he was little, his father came from a very religious family, left religion, but kept some of the traditions. He said every Yom Kippur, before Yom Kippur started, before Day of Atonement started, they would take not a chicken, but a coin, put it around your head and say, you know, this coin is now taking, I did everything that I could. I went and I checked and I asked for forgiveness and I, try to fix everything that I could and I ask God to forgive me now. Well, if I didn't, you know, this coin is going to take away or the chicken is going to take away my sins. And then you donate the money, tzedakah, or the, you know, the chicken to whatever. Um, and it's another process. Another one is what we call hatarat nedarim. It's the, the night before Yom Kippur when, you know, four people, three people meet together, two are the witnesses, and the one says, you know, everything that I vowed this year is now, I'm asking for it to be released. Um, my kids keep, keep on talking, playing with it now. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm vowing, I'm releasing you from vows. It's like, it's, it's, it's a game here at home now. What is this strange thing? This is a very esoteric tradition in some of the Hasidic uh, quartz. It's um, the night, again, it's just before Yom Kippur, you see people are already getting dressed in white, but the shoes are still leather shoes. Uh, the chassid, the, 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 the disciple is on the floor, the rebbe is beating him softly, 39, you know, times. And this is another way to say, God, I am, I'm willing to get anything from you, punish me just to go through this trial, you know, and be judged to lie. Um, 40 in Judaism is the number for purification. 40 days in the, uh, 40 years in the desert, 40 days between the first of the, of the Lul to Yom Kippur and so on. But I really think, as I said before, the hardest of the hardest is the simple tshuva, is the one that is between people and people, like really, really repentance. A little bit of 
going back to Nachlaot and the vibes of Nachlaot, Reb Arya Levin, a very inspirational rabbi that used to live in Nachlaot and talked a lot about humility and uh, how to return to who you really are. And just a little story about him. He used to visit people, sick people in hospitals and prisoners. And one day he went out of his, you know, this is him in his, you know, not in the graffiti near his home. Uh, he went out of home and a man passed near, saw him, turned around, went to the other side. So Reb Arya went to the other side and him and the, this young man met. And Reb Arya knew this man because he, wa he was one of the um, uh, prisoners that Julia is going to talk to you about ne next week uh, at uh, Surah Um And Reb Arya said, young man, why did you uh, walk away? You saw me. So the young man says, you know, Reb Arya, when you used to come and visit us in jail, I used to put a kippah, a yarmulka, to, as a matter of respect. And now, you know, I, I'm not wearing one. So Reb Arya said to him, young man, you're a very tall man. I cannot see your head, but I can see straight to your heart. And he shook his hand and went off. If you're an educator, you know that experiential learning is very, very um, important in order to, you know, be, to have a, a successful learning experience. And this time of the year has, you know, touches so many of our senses. We have a text and we have music and we have action that we need to do. And all of this is in order to really get us into the mindset of, you know, preparing for the trial. And we even have a special musical tune. We can, you know, talk a lot about what um, the word shofar comes from the word le chapelle to improve, improve yourselves, and of course, is related to an event that happened right under what's today the dome of the rock, uh, on the rock where, you know, the akeda, the binding of Isaac, when the boy was replaced with the ram. So again, it's a reminder to connect to our very, very ancient ancestors. But I want to go back to the question of, do you ever do an inventory? Do you ever take an inventory? And if yes, when? You can write in the chat or you can say, is it part of your life to, you know, stop and look at what's going on? Some of us do it. I think Corona did a lot of this for us. Like we had to pause and we had to, and pausing brings a lot of thoughts. One of the interesting things, a lot of us do it at night before we go to sleep. A lot of, the, of us do it during hard times. Uh, a lot of us also do it during, um, I do it. <laughs> I'm a strange person. When I have a birthday, it's usually about where am I? What's going on? It's, and then it's party time. So congratulations, guys, because we're all five days old now. According to Jewish tradition, the world was created on the 25th of the month of Elul. And us as a collective in the image of Adam and Eve were born on the first of the month of Tishrei, which is Rosh Hashanah. So the time of the year is a, you know, community invitation to take a look at, you know, as we're coming into our next year, our next birthday, how did we use the time that we have? This time is also connected to Moses and the Ten Commandments because you know that Moses went up and down Mount Sinai three times. First, he breaks the tabernacles, he sees the people, you know, the golden calf, he breaks them, then he goes up again, then he goes down, and the last time, 
the first of the month of Eruli goes up, and on Yom Kippur it goes down. And the 13 qualities of God that we heard before, Adonai, Adonai, El, Rachum, Bechanu, Dara, this is the text that God basically teaches Moses, because who needed 40 days to be on the mountain? God is so big, he can forgive so easily. What's the problem? But Moses needed to go back and lead the people. He needed to develop a trust. He needed to learn how to forgive like God. And the 13 qualities, this text is a text that is basically teaching us what are the qualities that we should adopt as people if we want to be God-like. Why in the fall? Why is this process happening now? Why is the beginning of the year, the new year is in the fall? Like you would expect the beginning of the new year blooming like look at steve's background this is what the beginning should look like beautiful no the jewish world says this is not how things start things start in quiet things start when you don't see them things start in the transition when the when the dead is being put into the ground to become the compost of what needs to grow next year but if we look at it from another perspective this culture that we're sharing was developed in this land where I'm living now, and it was, it was developed by people that were uh, farmers. And if you go out to the fields now, okay, this is a picture that I've taken a few mornings ago, like I go out very early in the morning, uh, of the, this is one of the only flowers that is now, like he's saying to us that the fall is coming, but basically everything is completely dry and there's no farming. When does the farming start? Right after the holiday of Sukkot. We're going to start praying for the rain. So this time of the year is the time when basically we're saying, okay, God, we're gonna develop such a strong relationship with you now. We're gonna be such good people that you're going to send us to life and it's going to be uh, performed with the rain that you're gonna give us. So that you're going to sustain us that we can have, you know, food and food is life. Going back to Jerusalem, tomb of King David on Mount of Zion, a center of worship, very, very interesting spot. Julia, how much more time do we have? Um, well, we don't actually have any. No, five more minutes. I need five, five more. Can we get five, five minutes? Five minutes? Five. Can you okay. get five? Five minutes it is. All right. All right. Okay. The tomb of King David, King David who wrote Psalms, King David who was such a sinner. You may know, you know, his sending Uriah to the battle to die in order to um, meet with his wife. So the biggest sinner is the guy who teaches us how to, you know, how to... Um, return to who we really are. I want to show us Ashkenazi Slichot at the tomb of King David. It's one of the most intense Slichot spots. Now, pay attention to this part, the beginning, look at the people, listen to the music, and then I'm going to show you another one of the end part. Okay, take a look. got the vibe let's get the vibe of the end of the slichot prayers ashkenazi So the first part, 
completely sad. A lot of the Ashkenazi slichot is about the destruction and the longing. And then I'm going to take us through some views of Jerusalem as we go towards um, the Western Wall. And then it moves into joy and um, hoping, hoping for redemption. That's the whole of a synagogue in the Jewish quarter. That's what it looks like from up above. You can see the division for the capsules. You see the, 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 the division. Okay, this is how it looks like right now when people are praying there. This is from the top, top, top of this beautiful synagogue. A little study room. And we're getting very, very close to the place where we're almost going to end, the Western Wall. Now, I want to show you two things. One is what this place looks like on regular times. I mean, pre-corona times on the last night before Yom Kippur. And if you've never been in Jerusalem on the night before Yom Kippur, you never felt what a pilgrimage is. So let's join for this experience for just a moment. Last. If you were to be in the Western Wall on the night before uh, Yom Kippur, there is no way you would be able to do that. Okay, no one can get to the wall on regular times during this time of the year. But wherever we are, if you wish, you know, you can take a moment um, and think. You know, if I was there, or if I would be to write a note, because I have to tell you, for many years writing notes and prayer was not really a part of my life until some things happened. And uh, many of them are actually connected to uh, the Jewish uh, communities from America. I have to tell you that the first Yom Kippur that I ever fasted in, the first Yom Kippur that I ever attended uh, services in, and it was in Western North Carolina in Asheville when I was 16 year old and I was adopted. I was in, in a, an exchange program and I was uh, adopted by the Jewish, conserv uh, Jewish conservative family. And that was the first time that I felt comfortable in a synagogue. Ever since then, there was a long way. I worked with a lot of communities from all over the Jewish world in North America and a lot of my Jewish identity and the way it's presented here to my children and to other people that I'm working with in Israel today is much, much, much influenced by the liberal communities in America, which basically say we have a gift. We can take it and we can work with it in a way that fits us. So if you were to write a note now, what would you write there? What's up? Not uh, what's up, but what's up? Where am I? What am I grateful for in this challenging time? What am I wishing for? 
And if I could pray for somebody else, because Judaism tells us that when you pray for somebody else, what you need will be given to you very quickly. So I'll give us a minute to think about that. And I want to end with a song that I really love. It comes from a very, very deep text by Rabbi Cook, which was the uh, chief rabbi of the state of Israel for a long time. And I've, for those of you who wish, send me a, 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 a um, email, and I'll send you some texts that are really special and some links. Rabbi Cook says that when you do tshuva, if you only look at the bad things that you've done and of your whatever character defects, you're missing the whole thing. He says, if you don't look at your qualities, you're not saying the truth. He says, each one of us have tons of qualities and amazing things that we've done. And we have to put them on the scale as we do our tshuva. Part of our tshuva is to th- see them. And he ends this text and he says, Ben Adam, human being, Bat Adam, ascend towards the heavens, ascend towards the heights, ascend, for you have mighty powers. You have wings of spirit, wings of mighty eagles. Do not forsake them, lest they forsake you. Seek them, and they will find you immediately. If you know the tune, you're welcome to join me. Ben Adam, once again, Ben Thank you for letting me um, be with you. Um, it's been a pleasure. I would love any feedbacks. I'm going to put all my details here. It's tons. You can take a quick screenshot, and I uh, put it also on the on the um, what it's called the chat. Um, any feedbacks, any thoughts? If you want any of the text, anything, just write me, and I'll email it back to you. Um, as we said before, this is a very um, powerful time for us in Israel and for us tour guides, inventing ourselves and trying to find a way to bring Israel to you wherever you are in the world. I would very, very much appreciate it if you go into the link. Um, it's israelvirtualtour.com Tamar, and you can even specify and write for Tamar. There is a spot for donations there. Anything that you can, you know, as much as you enjoyed, um, we would appreciate your support. This is a very, um, uh, it's a project that we really, really want to continue doing, bringing Israel to you wherever you are. You have my, all of my details here, and I'm happy to, um, 
to hear from you. Thank you so much. I appreciate any feedback. You could unmute yourself and talk to me. I'm still here. Hi. Hey, Tamar, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure, and I had no idea that she sings so well. I did not know that, so uh, um, that was highly appreciated, and I hope I didn't disturb you too much with uh, my attempt to sing. Uh, it's the so Alena moving. Uh, it's uh, you know, this is not the best I can do. Anyhow, so, so thank you so much, and it was indeed special and, uh, and different, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, I did, for sure. So, Tamal, uh, thank you, and Gemach uh, Adimatova, and Tom Kal. And uh, I wish, you know, all of us the best, best year, much better. By the way, if any of you want to be informed, I, I do some video, like short videos from time to time, especially during holidays about meetings and stuff. You can leave your email to me and, you know, I just, from time to time, I said, I said you know, little things. So if you wish, I'm more than happy to uh, have you join that. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, again, if you have any further questions, you are welcome. Uh, and if not, the Thank you all for coming. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you again next week uh, with two very different topics. So, Julia, do you have times for those two so we can put them on our calendars? We have what? Times? Yeah, it's got to be same time as tonight. Uh, since it's not a uh, live Zoom on location, so it's uh, 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Okay, both, both Tuesday and Thursday? Right, yes. exactly. Okay, yes. good. Thank Thursday you. Thursday and Tuesday. And uh, we're going to be talking about water and peace, and we will be talking about a detention camp and illegal immigration. And uh, you are so much welcome. Perfect. Thank you, Tamar. That was Thank very interesting so to, to uh, connect the uh, cultural rituals with people, which I think was your objective. You accomplished it. Thank you for taking that uh, the tact on, on things, uh, particularly this time of the year. Yeah. And in this crazy year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks again. Thank you so much. This uh, was a very moving presentation. I thank you. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Petri. Thanks. Uh, okay, that's it. That's it for tonight, guys. Donations Laila are for us. Appreciate it. Laila Tov. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Sure. Thank, Thank you for joining us. Thank yeah, you Laila for joining us. Bye. Laila Tov. Laila Tov. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Okay.